Okay, now let's take a look at some applications of remote sensing. First of all, who uses remote sensing? We already saw some of the uses in the, the NASA video at the beginning. Essentially, anyone who takes pictures of an object is using remote sensing. Now, why would you use remote sensing? Remote sensing has the ability to gather data worldwide in locations that may not be accessible. Large-scale data can be gathered, which is not practical and maybe not even possible to measure directly. It also covers a wide area rather than just a single point at a measurement station. Thus, it's more representative on a regional scale without the need for a dense network of sensors. It can also cover multiple spatial scales, local, regional, continental, and global scale. It offers the ability to have continuous real-time measurements. And remote sensing data can also have very high resolution with fine details, especially some modern satellites can have resolutions as high as one meter or even greater. There are two types of satellites. The first type is geostationary. This is positioned over the equator in an orbit that follows Earth's rotation in such a way that it continuously stays over the same point on Earth at all times. A geostation orbit is very high above the Earth, it's about 35,700 kilometers above the ground, and it's used when continuous monitoring over a specific location is needed. Um, probably the most notable example of geostationary satellites are weather satellites, and the advantage is that it has a continuous view over a desired location, and the data is always available. The downsides, however, is that it has weak coverage at high latitudes, and in fact you can't even see right over the poles with a geostationary satellite. And being at a higher altitude also means lower image resolution and quality. And so on the flip side we also have polar orbiting satellites. A polar orbiting satellite traverses in a north-south direction several times a day. This is called a low Earth orbit. The height can vary, but it's typically about 700 kilometers above the surface, and it makes a full rotation around the Earth about every 90 minutes. This is used when coverage over the whole Earth is desired, and the benefit of being so much closer to the Earth is that it can have a much higher resolution, and it also over offers coverage that's impossible with a geostationary satellite, such as over the poles. The downside, however, is that it only passes over the same point once every 20 days, and it takes just a single image when it flies over, meaning that it's not continuous. Now, in this picture, you see that there are other low-Earth orbiting satellites that are not polar orbiting, but those are mainly used for communications and other purposes, almost never used in remote sensing. And if you look at polar orbit on a map, this is what the path would look like traversing in each orbit. Okay, so now let's take a look at how satellites can be used to measure air quality. Let's start with a few examples. The first and probably most common is MODIS. This stands for the Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectroradiometer. There are two identical MODIS instruments. One is on NASA's Terra satellite and the other is on NASA's Aqua satellite. They were launched in 1999 and 2002, respectively. They're polar orbiting satellites, and they're passive, which means they observe visible and infrared bands. In total, it has 36 bands, and the spatial resolution on the ground is between 250 and 1,000 meters. This varies depending on the bands. What MODIS measures is aerosol optical depth, AOD. And one of, it's one of the most simple and also most useful parameters in air quality remote sensing. AOD is calculated by the amount of reflected sunlight that is received by the sensor, as opposed to being absorbed or scattered by pa particles, also known as aerosols, in the air. In other words, it measures how obscured the sunlight is. This is a very good proxy for estimating amount of air pollution. Typically, it's calculated using 550 nanometer wavelength, that's green light, but other wavelengths can be used as well. In general, a small value of AOD represents clean air, and a large value represents polluted air. Uh, just some typical values 
point zero two is very clean air. Point zero eight is what you might see at a day on the beach. You might see just a tiny bit of haze over the sea. And even point two is considered reasonably clean. But once you get to point six, that's where you start getting into relatively polluted air. In terms of health, this might be called unhealthy for sensitive groups. And then a value of 1.5 is what you might see as smoke or dust. And then anything above 3 is merely complete visual obstruction. This can happen, for example, in extreme cases in China or India during a smog episode. The next example is VIRS. This stands for Visual Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite. This is on board NASA's SUAMI NPP satellite. That stands for the National Polar Orbiting Partnership. Now, despite the name, it's not a Finnish satellite, but it's named after the Finnish-American scientist named Werner SUAMI. It was launched in 2011. It has 22 bands, 7 visible, 14 infrared, and one night band that's used for viewing cities, fires, and other lighted objects at night. It has a resolution between 350 and 750 meters, also dependent on the band. The interesting thing is that VIRS was built as a replacement for MODIS. Originally, MODIS was designed with a lifetime of six years. It was launched in 1999 and 2002. Two, and so MODIS has been alive for 20 years, and it's still actively collecting data and being used by scientists worldwide. The next example is Calypso. This stands for Cloud Aerosol LiDAR Infrared Pathfinder Satellite Observations. This is a joint project between NASA in the U.S. and CNES in France. It's a polar orbiting satellite, and it's an active sensor. It uses a downward-pointing LIDAR to profile the atmosphere. But don't worry, the laser that it uses is pretty weak and it's eye safe. Now remember how active remote sensing can determine distance of an object and not just see light coming from the object. This means that Calypso can offer a vertical profile, whereas AOD is just a single value over each point. Because it's a laser, it has a very narrow beam. This means it has a high resolution that's ideal for measuring certain areas of interest, such as a smoke plume. The example being the, the Wallow Fire in Arizona, United States, as shown in that example on the left. Of course, the downside is that with only one narrow beam, it only gets narrow coverage. Calypso uses a 532 nanometer laser, which is very close to the wavelength used in AOD. This makes it easy to compare to AOD measurements but with a single spectral band, its uses are more limited than a multispectral passive sensor. So how do we validate and quality control this remote sensing data? Well, it's not as simple as it sounds, and it can actually be quite tricky. Satellite sensors are tested rigorously on the ground before launch, but once they're in space, physical contact and maintenance with the sensor is not possible. This includes repairs, adjustments, and calibrations. AOD data is validated using Aeronet. This stands for the Aerosol Robotic Network. Aeronet consists of sensors at stations all around the world, shown in this map up in the upper right corner. It works by pointing a sensor at the sun and measuring the intensity of the sun that reaches the sensor through the atmosphere. This Aeronet data is then compared to data from the satellites at the same location and time when they fly over. There are some limitations of satellites. Like anything, they have pros and cons. And the first thing is that the reflectance bands don't work at night. The VIRS sensor does have a, a night band, but this is used for looking at things that emit visible light, like cities or fires, and that's different from reflectance of sunlight. And clouds, of course, can get in the way of many measurements, including AOD. The other thing is satellites can be incredibly expensive. For example, the Suomi NPP satellite launched in 2011 had a total cost of over 8 billion U.S. dollars. The Landsat 8 launched in 2013 
was just over 900 million U.S. dollars. And the other thing about satellite data is that they collect tremendous amount of data, many gigabytes a day from each satellite. This data has to be collected and stored somehow, and that takes a lot of computing power and storage. However, this is becoming less and less of a problem over time because computer power and storage is getting better. And there are some important notes about satellites. With remote sensing measurements, they are indirect. This means that the results are derived and calculated, and thus they are inferred. And whenever you infer something, there is always the possibility of data getting misinterpreted or misrepresentative. This isn't just in terms of human error, but also computer calculations. They're only estimates. Many factors can affect a remote sensing measurement not related to the actual properties of the target. In terms of the sensor, this is usually called interference. Scientifically, this might also be called noise, although the less formal but probably more common terminology is clutter. And other factors can impair air quality can include haze from humidity, for example, and that can affect AOD even though it's not actually pollution. So it's very important that the user of the data understands that not all data is exact. Thank you very much.